Harry S. Truman was an American politician who served as the 33rd President of the United States, assuming the office upon the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt during the waning months of World War II. He is known for launching the Marshall Plan to rebuild the economy of Western Europe, for leading the Cold War against Soviet and Chinese communism through the Truman Doctrine and NATO, and for intervening in the Korean War. In domestic affairs, he was a moderate Democratic whose liberal proposals were a continuation of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, but the conservative-dominated Congress blocked most of them. He used the veto power 180 times, which is more than any president since then, and saw 12 overridden by Congress. Only Grover Cleveland and Franklin D. Roosevelt used the veto so often, and only Gerald Ford and Andrew Johnson saw so many veto overrides. He also used nuclear weapons to end World War II, desegregated the U.S. armed forces, supported a newly independent Israel, and was a founder of the United Nations. Truman was born in Independence, Missouri, and spent most of his youth on his family's 600-acre farm near Independence. In the last months of World War I, he served in combat in France as an artillery officer with his National Guard unit. After the war, he briefly owned a haberdashery in Kansas City, Missouri, and joined the Democratic Party in the political machine of Tom Pendergast. Truman was first elected to public office as a county official in 1922, and then as a U.S. Senator in 1934. He gained national prominence as chairman of the Truman Committee, formed in March 1941, which aimed to find and correct problems such as waste and inefficiency in federal government wartime contracts. After serving as a United States Senator from Missouri and briefly as Vice President, he succeeded to the presidency on April 12, 1945, upon the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Germany surrendered on Truman's 61st birthday, just a few weeks after he assumed the presidency. But the war with Imperial Japan raged on and was expected to last at least another year. Truman approved the use of atomic bombs to end the fighting and to spare the hundreds of thousands of American and Japanese lives that would inevitably be lost in the planned invasion of Japan and Japanese-held islands in the Pacific. Although this decision and the numerous issues that arose as a result of it remain the subject of debate to this day, it was one of the principal factors that forced Japan's unconditional surrender. Truman presided over an unexpected surge in economic prosperity as America sought readjustment. After long years of depression and war, his presidency was a turning point in foreign affairs as the United States engaged in an internationalist foreign policy and renounced isolationism. Truman helped found the United Nations in 1945, issued the Truman Doctrine in 1947 to contain communism, and got the $13 billion Marshall Plan enacted to rebuild Western Europe. His political coalition was based on the White South, labor unions, farmers, ethnic groups, and traditional Democrats across the North. Truman was able to rally these groups of supporters during the 1948 presidential election and win a surprise victory that secured a presidential term in his own right. The Soviet Union became an enemy in the Cold War. Truman oversaw the Berlin Airlift of 1948 and the creation of NATO in 1949, but was unable to stop communists from taking over China. When Communist North Korea invaded South Korea in 1950, he sent U.S. troops and gained U.N. approval for the Korean War. After initial successes in Korea, however, the U.N. forces were thrown back by Chinese intervention, and the conflict was stalemated throughout the final years of Truman's presidency. On domestic issues, bills endorsed by Truman often faced opposition from a conservative Congress dominated by the Southern legislators, but his administration was able to successfully guide the American economy through the post-war 
economic challenges. Truman maintained that civil rights were a moral priority, and in 1948 submitted the first comprehensive civil rights legislation and issued executive orders to start racial integration in the military and federal agencies. Allegations were raised of corruption in the Truman administration, linked to certain cabinet members and senior White House staff. This became a central campaign issue in the 1952 presidential election, and helped account for Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower's electoral victory. Scholars, starting in 1962, ranked Truman's presidency as near great. Since then he has ranked from 5th to ninth place from the top. Early Life and Career Harry S. Truman was born on May 8, 1884, in Lamar, Missouri, the oldest child of John Anderson Truman and Martha Ellen Young Truman. His parents chose the name Harry after his mother's brother, Harrison, Harry, Young. While the S did not stand for any one name, it was chosen as his middle initial to honor both of his grandfathers, Anderson Chip Truman and Solomon Young. John Truman was a farmer and livestock dealer. The family lived in Lamar until Harry was 10 months old, when they moved to a farm near Harrisonville, Missouri. The family next moved to Belton, and in 1887 to his grandparents' 600-acre farm in Grandview. As a boy, Truman was interested in music, reading, war, and history, all encouraged by his mother, with whom he was very close. As president, he solicited political as well as personal advice from her. After graduating from Independence High School, now William Chrisman High School, in 1901, Truman enrolled in Spalding's Commercial College, a Kansas City business school. He studied bookkeeping, shorthand, and typing, but left after a year. Truman is the most recent president who did not earn a college degree. World War I Because he was unable to afford university tuition, Truman had thought of going to the costless United States Military Academy at West Point, but he was refused an appointment because of poor eyesight. When the United States entered World War I, Truman rejoined the National Guard. He helped recruit new soldiers as his unit expanded, and his success led the men of his battery to elect him as their first lieutenant. In mid-1918, about one million soldiers of the American Expeditionary Forces were in France. Truman's unit joined in a massive pre-arranged assault barrage on September 26, 1918. At the opening of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, they advanced with difficulty over pitted terrain to follow the infantry, and they set up an observation post west of Chepi. On September 27, Truman saw through his binoculars an enemy artillery battery setting up across a river in a position allowing them to fire upon the neighboring 28th Division. Truman's orders limited him to targets facing the 35th Division, but he ignored this and patiently waited until the Germans had walked their horses well away from their guns, ensuring that they could not relocate out of range of Truman's battery. He then ordered his men to open fire and destroyed the enemy battery. His actions were credited with saving the lives of 28th Division soldiers who otherwise would have come under fire from the Germans. Truman was given a dressing down by his regimental commander, Colonel Carl D. Clem, but he was not court-martialed or otherwise punished. In other action during the Meuse-Argonne fighting, Truman's battery provided support for George S. Patton's tank brigade. The war was a transformative experience for Truman that brought out his leadership qualities. He had entered the service in 1917 as a family farmer who had worked in clerical jobs that did not require the ability to motivate and direct others. But during the war he gained leadership experience and a record of success that greatly enhanced and supported his post-war political career in Missouri. Truman was brought up in the Presbyterian and Baptist churches. He avoided revivals and sometimes ridiculed revivalist preachers. 
He rarely spoke about religion, which to him primarily meant ethical behavior along traditional Protestant lines. Most of the soldiers that he commanded in the war were Catholics, developing leadership and interpersonal skills, which later made him a successful politician, enabled him to get along well with them, as he did with soldiers of other Christian denominations and the unit's Jewish members. Continued Military Service Truman was discharged from the Army as a major in May 1919. After his election to the U.S. Senate, Truman was transferred to the General Assignments Group, a holding unit for less active officers. He had not been consulted or notified in advance. Politics As Jackson County Judge After his wartime service, Truman returned to Independence, where he married Bess Wallace on June 28, 1919. Shortly before the wedding, Truman and Jacobson opened a haberdashery together at 104 West 12th Street in downtown Kansas City. After brief initial success, the store went bankrupt during the recession of 1921. With the help of the Kansas City Democratic machine led by Tom Pendergast, Truman was elected in 1922 as County Court Judge of Jackson County's Eastern District. This was an administrative rather than judicial position, somewhat similar to county commissioners elsewhere. At the time Jackson County elected a judge from the Western District, Kansas City, one from the Eastern District, Jackson County outside Kansas City, and a presiding judge elected countywide. Statue by Charles Keck of Andrew Jackson outside the Jackson County Courthouse that was installed by Truman. In 1926, Truman was elected presiding judge with the support of the Pendergast machine, and he was re-elected in 1930. Truman helped coordinate the 10-year plan, which transformed Jackson County and the Kansas City skyline with new public works projects, including an extensive series of roads and construction of a new white-and-white -white designed county court building. Also in 1926, he became president of the National Old Trails Road Association, NOTRA. He oversaw the dedication in the late 1920s of a series of 12 Madonna of the Trail monuments, honoring pioneer women, which were installed along the trail. In 1933, Truman was named Missouri's director for the Federal Reemployment Program, part of the Civil Works Administration at the request of Postmaster General James Farley. This was payback to Pendergast for delivering the Kansas City vote to Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1932 presidential election. The appointment confirmed Pendergast's control over federal patronage jobs in Missouri and marked the zenith of his power. It also created a relationship between Truman and Roosevelt aide Harry Hopkins and assured Truman's avid support for the New Deal. As U.S. Senator from Missouri After serving as a county judge, Truman wanted to run for governor or Congress, but Pendergast rejected these ideas. Truman then thought that he might serve out his career in some well-paying county sinecure, but circumstances changed when Pendergast reluctantly backed him in the 1934 Democratic primary for the U. S. Senate after four other potential candidates turned him down. Truman assumed office with a reputation as the senator from Pendergast. Quote, he turned over patronage decisions to Pendergast, though Truman always maintained that he voted his conscience. He later defended the patronage decisions by saying that, by offering a little to the machine. During the U.S. Senate election in 1940, United States Attorney Maurice Milligan, Jacob Milligan's brother, and former Governor Lloyd Stark both challenged Truman in the Democratic primary. Truman was politically weakened by Pendergast's imprisonment for income tax evasion the previous year. The senator had remained loyal, having claimed that Republican judges, not the Roosevelt administration, were responsible for the boss's downfall. In late 1940, Truman traveled to various military bases, 
the waste and profiteering which he saw led him to use his subcommittee chairmanship in the Committee on Military Affairs to begin investigations into abuses while the nation prepared for war. A separate committee was set up under Truman to conduct a formal investigation. The Roosevelt administration supported this plan rather than weather a more hostile probe by the House of Representatives. Chairmanship of what came to be known as the Truman Committee made him a national figure. If we see that Germany is winning we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning we ought to help Germany. And that way let them kill as many as possible although I don't want to see Hitler victorious. Under any circumstances, the War Production Board discovered that although their mathematical models attempted to account for all possible sources of insufficiency, that in practice insufficient material was arriving at the front. Vice Presidency Sen. Truman visits his mother in Grandview, Missouri. After being nominated the Democratic candidate for vice president, Lauren Bacall lounges on top of the piano while Vice President Truman plays for servicemen at the National Press Club Canteen in Washington, D.C. Vice President Henry Wallace was popular among Democratic voters, but he was viewed as too far to the left and too friendly to labor for some of Roosevelt's advisors. The president and several of his confidantes wanted to replace Wallace with someone more acceptable to Democratic Party leaders and Roosevelt's advisors. Knowing that Roosevelt might not live out a fourth term, outgoing Democratic National Committee Chairman Frank C. Walker, incoming Chairman Hannigan, Party Treasurer Edwin W. Polly, strategist Ed Flynn, Chicago Mayor Edward Joseph Kelly, and lobbyist George E. Allen all wanted to keep Wallace off the ticket. Truman's nomination was dubbed the Second Missouri Compromise and was well received. The Roosevelt Truman ticket achieved a 432 99 electoral vote victory in the election, defeating the Republican ticket of Governor Thomas E. Dewey of New York and running mate Governor John Bricker of Ohio. Truman was sworn in as vice president on January 20, 1945. Truman's brief vice presidency was relatively uneventful. On April 10, 1945, Truman had been vice president for 82 days when President Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945. Presidency Truman surrounded himself with his old friends and appointed several to high positions that seemed well beyond their competence including his two secretaries of the Treasury, Fred Vinson and John Snyder. His closest friend in the White House was his military aide Harry H. Vaughn, who seemed to others like a huge joke. To many in the general public, gambling and bourbon swilling, however low-key, were not quite presidential, neither was the intemperate give M hell campaign style nor the occasional profane phrase uttered in public. Coger exemplified a larger problem, the tension between his attempts at an image of leadership necessarily a cut above the ordinary, and an informality that at times appeared to verge on crudeness. First Term Assuming Office and the Atomic Bomb Shortly after taking the oath of office, Truman spoke to reporters, Boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know if you fellas ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me what happened yesterday, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me." Quote. Upon assuming the presidency, Truman asked all the members of Roosevelt's cabinet to remain in place, and told them that he was open to their advice. He emphasized a central principle of his administration. He would be the one making decisions and they were to support him. We have discovered the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. It may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era, after Noah and his fabulous Ark. In the wake of Allied victory, Truman journeyed to Europe for the Potsdam Conference. He was there when he learned that the Trinity test of the first atomic bomb on July 16 had been 
successful, he hinted to Joseph Stalin that the U.S. was about to use a new kind of weapon against the Japanese. Though this was the first time the Soviets had been officially given information about the atomic bomb, Stalin was already aware of the bomb project. Having learned about it, through espionage, long before Truman did, in August, the Japanese government refused surrender demands as specifically outlined in the Potsdam Declaration and with the invasion of mainland Japan imminent, Truman approved the schedule for dropping the two available bombs. Truman always said that attacking Japan with atomic bombs saved many lives on both sides. Military estimates for the invasion of mainland Japan were that it could take a year and result in 250 000 to 500 000 American casualties. Hiroshima was bombed on August 6, and Nagasaki three days later, leaving 105 000 dead. Supporters Strikes and Economic Upheaval The end of World War II was followed by an uneasy transition from war to a peacetime economy. The costs of the war effort were enormous and Truman was intent on decreasing government expenditures on the military as quickly as possible. Demobilizing the military and reducing the size of the various services was a cost-saving priority. The effect of demobilization on the economy was unknown, but fears existed that the nation would slide back into a depression. A great deal of work had to be done to plan how best to transition to peacetime production of goods while avoiding mass unemployment for returning veterans. Government officials did not have consensus as to what economic course the post-war U.S. should take. In addition, Roosevelt had not paid attention to Congress in his final years, and Truman faced a body where a combination of Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats formed a powerful voting bloc. The president was faced with the reawakening of labor management conflicts that had lain dormant during the war years, severe shortages in housing and consumer products, and widespread dissatisfaction with inflation, which at one point hit 6% in a single month. Every single one of the strikers and their demagogue leaders have been living in luxury. Now I want you who are my comrades in arms to come with me and eliminate the Lewises, the Whitneys, the Johnstons, the Communist Bridges. His staff was stunned. Top aide Clark Clifford rewrote and toned down this speech. Truman did go to Congress and he called for a new law to draft all the railroad strikers into the army. As he was concluding his speech he read a message just handed to him that the strike was settled on presidential terms. Truman nevertheless finished the speech, and a few hours later the House voted to draft the strikers. Taft killed the bill in the Senate. Although labor strife was muted after the settlement of the railway strike, it continued through Truman's presidency. The president's approval rating dropped from 82% in the polls in January 1946 to 52% by June 1946. Truman cooperated closely with the Republican leaders on foreign policy, though he fought them bitterly on domestic issues. The power of the labor unions was significantly curtailed by the Taft-Hartley Act, which was enacted over Truman's veto. Truman twice vetoed bills to lower income tax rates in 1947. Although the initial vetoes were sustained, Congress overrode his veto of a tax cut bill in 1948. The parties did cooperate on some issues. Congress passed the Presidential Succession Act of 1947, making the Speaker of the House and the President pro tempore of the Senate rather than the Secretary of State next in line to the presidency after the Vice President. As he readied for the 1948 election, Truman made clear his identity as a Democrat in the New Deal tradition advocating national health insurance. United Nations, Marshall Plan, Cold War, China Truman's press secretary was his old friend Charles Griffith Ross. He had great integrity but, says Alonzo L. Hamby. As a senior White House aide he was a better newsman than news handler. 
He never established a policy of coordinating news releases throughout the executive branch. Frequently bumbled details. Never developed a strategy for marketing the president's image and failed to establish a strong press office. Quote, As a Wilsonian internationalist, Truman strongly supported the creation of the United Nations and included Eleanor Roosevelt on the delegation to the UN's first General Assembly. Although he had little personal expertise on foreign matters, Truman listened closely to his top advisors, especially George Marshall and Dean Acheson. He won bipartisan support for both the Truman Doctrine, which formalized a policy of Soviet containment, and the Marshall Plan, which aimed to help rebuild post-war Europe. In 1952, Truman secretly consolidated and empowered the cryptologic elements of the United States by creating the National Security Agency, NSA. Truman was torn two ways about China, where the nationalists and communists were fighting a large-scale civil war. On the one hand, the nationalists had been major wartime allies and had large-scale popular support in the United States along with a powerful lobby. General George Marshall spent most of 1946 in China trying to negotiate a compromise, but failed. He convinced Truman that the nationalists would never win on their own, and that a very large-scale American intervention to stop the communists would significantly weaken America's opposition to the Soviets in Europe. By 1949, the communists under Mao Zedong had won the Civil War, the United States had a new enemy in Asia, and Truman came under fire from conservatives for losing China. Berlin Airlift On June 24, 1948, the Soviet Union blocked access to the three Western-held sectors of Berlin. The Allies had never negotiated a deal to guarantee supply of the sectors deep within the Soviet-occupied zone. The commander of the American Occupation Zone in Germany, General Lucius D. Clay, proposed sending a large armored column across the Soviet zone to West Berlin with instructions to defend itself if it were stopped or attacked. Truman believed this would entail an unacceptable risk of war. He approved Ernest Bevin's plan to supply the blockaded city by air. On June 25, the Allies initiated the Berlin Airlift, a campaign that delivered food and other supplies, such as coal, using military aircraft on a massive scale. Nothing like it had ever been attempted before, and no single nation had the capability, either logistically or materially, to have accomplished it. The airlift worked. Ground access was again granted on May 11, 1949. Nevertheless, the airlift continued for several months after that. The Berlin airlift was one of Truman's great foreign policy successes. It significantly aided his election campaign in 1948. Recognition of Israel President Truman in the Oval Office Receiving a Hanukkah menorah from the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, center, to the right is Abba Ibn. Ambassador of Israel to the U.S. Truman had long taken an interest in the history of the Middle East, and was sympathetic to Jews who sought to re-establish their ancient homeland in mandatory Palestine. As a senator, he announced support for Zionism. In 1943 he called for a homeland for those Jews who survived the Nazi regime. However, State Department officials were reluctant to offend the Arabs, who were opposed to the establishment of a Jewish state in the large region long populated and dominated culturally by Arabs. Secretary of Defense James Forrestal warned Truman of the importance of Saudi Arabian oil in another war. Truman replied that he would decide his policy on the basis of justice, not oil. Palestine was secondary to the goal of protecting the northern tier of Greece, Turkey, and Iran from communism, as promised by the Truman Doctrine. 1948 Election 
The 1948 presidential election is remembered for Truman's stunning come-from-behind victory. At the 1948 Democratic National Convention, Truman attempted to unify the party with a vague civil rights plank in the party platform. His intention was to assuage the internal conflicts between the northern and southern wings of his party. Events overtook his efforts. A sharp address given by Mayor Hubert Humphrey of Minneapolis, as well as the local political interests of a number of urban bosses, convinced the convention to adopt a stronger civil rights plank, which Truman approved wholeheartedly. All of Alabama's delegates, and a portion of Mississippi's, walked out of the convention in protest. President Harry S. Truman at the microphone, left. Harley O. Staggers and Harley M. Kilgore, 1948 in Kaiser, West Virginia on Whistle Stop Train. Within two weeks of the convention, in 1948 Truman issued Executive Order 9981, racially integrating the U.S. Armed Services. Truman's political advisors described the political scene as one unholy, confusing cacophony. Quote, they told Truman to speak directly to the people, in a personal way. The campaign was a 21,928-mile presidential odyssey. Truman was so widely expected to lose the 1948 election that the Chicago Tribune had printed papers, with this false headline when few returns were in. The large, mostly spontaneous gatherings at Truman's Whistle Stop events were an important sign of a change in momentum in the campaign. But this shift went virtually unnoticed by the National Press Corps. It continued reporting Republican Thomas Dewey's apparent impending victory as a certainty. One reason for the press's inaccurate projection was that polls were conducted primarily by telephone. But many people, including much of Truman's populist base, did not yet own a telephone. In the end, Truman held his progressive Midwestern base, won most of the southern states despite the civil rights plank, and squeaked through with narrow victories in a few critical states, notably Ohio, California, and Illinois. The final tally showed that the president had secured 303 electoral votes. Dewey 189, and Thurmond only 39. Henry Wallace got none. The defining image of the campaign came after Election Day, when an ecstatic Truman held aloft the erroneous front page of the Chicago Tribune with a huge headline proclaiming, Dewey defeats Truman. Quote, Second term. Truman's second inauguration was the first ever televised nationally. Korean War. President Truman signing a proclamation declaring a national emergency and authorizing U.S. entry into the Korean War. On June 25, 1950, Kim Il sung's Korean People's Army invaded South Korea, starting the Korean War. In the early weeks of the war, the North Koreans easily pushed back their southern counterparts. Truman promptly urged the United Nations to intervene. It did, authorizing troops under the UN flag led by U.S. General Douglas MacArthur. Truman decided that he did not need formal authorization from Congress, believing that most legislators supported his position. This would come back to haunt him later, when the stalemated conflict was dubbed Mr. Truman's War by legislators. By August 1950, U.S. troops pouring into South Korea under UN auspices were able to stabilize the situation. However, China surprised the UN forces with a large-scale invasion in November. The UN forces were forced back to below the 38th parallel, then recovered. I fired him. The dismissal of General Douglas MacArthur was among the least politically popular decisions in presidential history. Truman's approval ratings plummeted, and he faced calls for his impeachment from, among others, Senator Robert A. Taft. The war remained a frustrating stalemate for two years, with over 30,000 Americans killed, 
until an armistice ended the fighting in 1953. Worldwide Defense Truman and Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru during Nehru's visit to the United States. October 1949, the escalation of the Cold War was highlighted by Truman's approval of NSC-68, a secret statement of foreign policy. It called for tripling the defense budget and the globalization and militarization of containment policy whereby the U.S and its NATO allies would respond militarily to actual Soviet expansion. The document was drafted by Paul Nitze, who consulted state and defense officials. It was formally approved by President Truman as official national strategy after the war began in Korea. It called for partial mobilization of the U.S. economy to build armaments faster than the Soviets. The plan called for strengthening Europe weakening the Soviet Union, and for building up the U.S., both militarily and economically. Early in Truman's second term, his former Secretary of Defense Forrestal died soon after his retirement. Forrestal had become exhausted through years of hard labor during and after the war, and began to suffer depression. He retired in March 1949. Soon after, he was hospitalized, but he committed suicide in May. Truman was a strong supporter of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, which established a formal peacetime military alliance with Canada and democratic European nations that had not fallen under Soviet control following World War II. The treaty establishing it was widely popular and easily passed the Senate in 1949. Truman appointed General Eisenhower as commander. NATO's goals were to contain Soviet expansion in Europe and to send a clear message to communist leaders that the world's democracies were willing and able to build new security structures in support of democratic ideals. The U.S., Britain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Norway, Denmark, Portugal, Iceland, and Canada were the original treaty signatories. The alliance resulted in the Soviets establishing a similar alliance, called the Warsaw Pact. General Marshall was Truman's principal advisor on foreign policy matters, influencing such decisions as the U.S. choice against offering direct military aid to Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalist Chinese forces. In the Chinese Civil War with their communist opponents, Marshall's opinion was contrary to the counsel of almost all of Truman's other advisors. He thought that even propping up Chiang's forces would drain U.S. resources in Europe needed to deter the Soviets. Soviet Espionage and McCarthyism In August 1948, Whitaker Chambers a former spy for the Soviets and a senior editor at Time magazine, testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, HUSC. He said that an underground communist network had been working within the U.S. government since the 1930s, of which Chambers had been a member, along with Alger Hiss, until recently a senior State Department official, although Hiss denied the allegations. He was convicted in January 1950 for perjury for his denials under oath. The Soviet Union's success in exploding an atomic weapon in 1949 and the fall of the nationalist Chinese the same year led many Americans to conclude that subversion by Soviet spies was responsible, and to demand that communists be rooted out from the government and other places of influence. Wisconsin Senator McCarthy accused the State Department of harboring communists and rode the controversy to political fame. Charges that Soviet agents had infiltrated the government were believed by 78% of the people in 1946 and became a major campaign issue for Eisenhower in 1952. White House Renovations, Assassination Attempt In 1948, Truman ordered an addition to the exterior of the White House, a second-floor balcony in the South Portico, which came to be known as the Truman Balcony, 
the addition was unpopular. Some said it spoiled the appearance of the south facade, but it gave the first family more living space. The work uncovered structural faults which led engineering experts to conclude that the building, much of it over 130 years old, was in a dangerously dilapidated condition. That August, a section of floor collapsed, and Truman's bedroom and bathroom were closed as unsafe. No public announcement about the serious structural problems of the White House was made until after the 1948 election had been won. By then Truman had been informed that his new balcony was the only part of the building that was sound. The Truman family moved into nearby Blair House during the renovations, as the newer West Wing, including the Oval Office, remained open. Truman walked to and from his work across the street each morning and afternoon. In due course, the decision was made to demolish and rebuild the whole interior of the main White House, as well as excavate new basement levels and underpin the foundations. The famous exterior of the structure was buttressed and retained while the extensive renovations proceeded inside. The work lasted from December 1949 until March 1952. On November 1, 1950, Puerto Rican nationalists Griselio Torresla and Oscar Colazo attempted to assassinate Truman at Blair House. The attack drew new attention to security concerns surrounding Truman's residence at Blair House. He had jumped up from a nap and was watching the gunfight from his open bedroom window until Secret Service agents shouted at him to take cover. On the street outside the residence, Torresla mortally wounded a White House policeman, Leslie Cofelt, before he died. The officer shot and killed Torresla. Colazzo was wounded, stopped before he entered the house. He was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death in 1952. Truman commuted his sentence to life in prison. To try to settle the question of Puerto Rican independence, Truman allowed a plebiscite in Puerto Rico in 1952 to determine the status of its relationship to the U.S. Nearly 82% of the people voted in favor of a new constitution for the Estado Libre Asociado, a continued associated free state. Single quote. Steel and coal strikes. In response to a labor-management impasse arising from bitter disagreements over wage and price controls, Truman instructed his Secretary of Commerce, Charles W. Sawyer, to take control of a number of the nation's steel mills in April 1952. Truman cited his authority as Commander-in-Chief and the need to maintain an uninterrupted supply of steel for munitions to be used in the war in Korea. The Supreme Court found Truman's actions unconstitutional, however, and reversed the order in a major separation of powers decision. Youngstown Sheet and Tube Co. v. Sawyer, the 6-3 decision, which held that Truman's assertion of authority was too vague and was not rooted in any legislative action by Congress, was delivered by a court composed entirely of justices appointed by either Truman or Roosevelt. The High Court's reversal of Truman's order was one of the notable defeats of his presidency. Scandals and Controversies In 1950, the Senate, led by Estes Kefauver, investigated numerous charges of corruption among senior administration officials, some of whom received fur coats and deep freezers in exchange for favors. A large number of employees of the Internal Revenue Bureau Today the IRS were accepting bribes. 166 employees either resigned or were fired in 1950. Miss Truman is a unique American phenomenon with a pleasant voice of little size and fair quality. I've just read your lousy review of Margaret's concert. I've come to the conclusion that you are an 8 ulcer man on 4 ulcer pay. Quote, it seems to me that you are a frustrated old man who wishes he could have been successful. When you write such poppycock as was in the back section of the paper you work for it shows conclusively that you're off the beam and at least four of your ulcers are at work. Someday I hope to meet you. 
When that happens, you'll need a new nose, a lot of beefsteak for black eyes, and perhaps a supporter below. Pegler, a gutter snipe, is a gentleman alongside you. I hope you'll accept that statement as a worse insult than a reflection on your ancestry. Truman was criticized by many for the letter. However, he pointed out that he wrote it as a loving father and not as the president. In 1951, William M. Boyle, Truman's longtime friend and chairman of the Democratic National Committee, was forced to resign after being charged with financial corruption, civil rights. A 1947 report by the Truman administration titled To Secure These Rights presented a detailed 10-point agenda of civil rights reforms. In February 1948, the president submitted a civil rights agenda to Congress that proposed creating several federal offices devoted to issues such as voting rights and fair employment practices. Another executive order, also in 1948, made it illegal to discriminate against persons applying for civil service positions based on race. A third, in 1951, established the Committee on Government Contract Compliance, CGCC. This committee ensured that defense contractors did not discriminate because of race. Administration and Cabinet International Trips 1952 Election From left, President Harry S. Truman, Vice Presidential Nominee, Alabama Senator John J. Sparkman and Presidential Nominee, Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson, Oval Office, 1952. In 1951, the U.S. ratified the 22nd Amendment, making a president ineligible for election to a third term or for election to a second full term, after serving more than two remaining years of a term of a previously elected president. The latter clause would have applied to Truman's situation in 1952 except that a grandfather clause in the amendment explicitly exclude the amendment from applying to the incumbent president. At the time of the 1952 New Hampshire primary, no candidate had won Truman's backing. His first choice, Chief Justice Fred M. Vinson, had declined to run. Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson had also turned Truman down. Vice President Barkley was considered too old. Eisenhower gained the Republican nomination, with Senator Nixon as his running mate, and campaigned against what he denounced as Truman's failures. Korea, communism and corruption, he pledged to clean up the mess in Washington, and promised to go to Korea. Quote, Post-Presidency Upon leaving the presidency, Truman returned to Independence, Missouri, to live at the Wallace home he and Bess had shared for years with her mother. Truman, seated right, and his wife Bess, behind him, attend the signing of the Medicare Bill on July 30, 1965, by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Truman took out a personal loan from a Missouri bank shortly after leaving office, and then found a lucrative book deal for his memoirs. For the memoirs, Truman received only a flat payment of $670, oh, 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 and had to pay two-thirds of that in tax. He calculated he got $37, oh, 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 after he paid his assistance. The former president was quoted in 1957 as saying to then House Majority Leader John McCormick, had it not been for the fact that I was able to sell some property that my brother, sister, and I inherited from our mother, I would practically be on relief. But with the sale of that property I am not financially embarrassed." Quote. Truman's predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt, had organized his own presidential library, but legislation to enable future presidents to do something similar had not been enacted. Truman worked to garner private donations to build a presidential library, which he donated to the federal government to maintain and operate, a practice adopted by his successors. Truman supported Adlai Stevenson's second bid for the White House in 1956, 
Although he had initially favored Democratic Governor W. Averill Harriman of New York, death. On December 5, 1972, Truman was admitted to Kansas City's Research Hospital and Medical Center with lung congestion. From pneumonia, he developed multiple organ failure and died at 7.50 a.m. on December 26 at the age of 88. Tributes and Legacy Vigorous, hardworking, simple, he had grown up close to the soil of the Midwest and understood the struggles of the people on the farms and in the small towns. After ten years in the Senate, he had risen above the Pendergast organization. Still, he had come from a world of two-bit politicians, and its aura was one that he never was able to shed entirely. And he did retain certain characteristics one often sees in machine-bred politicians. Intense partisanship, stubborn loyalty, a certain insensitivity about the transgressions of political associates, and a disinclination for the companionship of intellectuals and artists. Legacy Truman poses in 1959 at the recreation of the Truman Oval Office at the Truman Library in 1959, with the famous The Buck Stops Here sign on his desk. The reverse of the sign says, I'm from Missouri, citing continuing divisions within the Democratic Party, the ongoing Cold War, and the boom and bust cycle. Journalist Samuel Lubell in 1952 stated that, after seven years of Truman's hectic, even furious, activity the nation seemed to be about on the same general spot as when he first came to office. Nowhere in the whole Truman record can one point to a single, decisive breakthrough, all his skills and energies, and he was among our hardest working presidents, were directed to standing still. When he left office in 1953, Truman was one of the most unpopular chief executives in history. His job approval rating of 22% in the Gallup poll of February 1952 was lower than Richard Nixon's, 24% in August 1974, the month that Nixon resigned. American public feeling towards Truman grew steadily warmer with the passing years. As early as 1962, a poll of 75 historians conducted by Arthur M. Schlesinger, Sr., ranked Truman among the near-great presidents. The period following his death consolidated a partial rehabilitation of his legacy among both historians and members of the public. Truman has had his latter-day critics as well. After a review of information available to Truman about the presence of espionage activities in the U.S. government, Democratic Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan concluded that Truman was almost willfully obtuse concerning the danger of American communism. The fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 caused Truman advocates to claim vindication for his decisions in the post-war period. According to Truman biographer Robert Dalek, his contribution to victory in the Cold War without a devastating nuclear conflict elevated him to the stature of a greater near-great president. Quote, According to historian Donald R. McCoy in his book on the Truman presidency, Harry Truman himself gave a strong and far from incorrect impression of being a tough, concerned and direct leader. He was occasionally vulgar, often partisan, and usually nationalistic. On his own terms, Truman can be seen as having prevented the coming of a Third World War and having preserved from communist depression much of what he called the free world. Yet clearly he largely failed to achieve his Wilsonian aim of securing perpetual peace, making the world safe for democracy, and advancing opportunities for individual development internationally. Sites and Honors 1973 stamp issued following Truman's death. Truman has been honored on 5 U.S. postage stamps issued between 1973 and 1999. In 1953, Truman received the Solomon Bublik Award of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In 1956, Truman traveled to Europe with his wife. In England, 
he met with Churchill and received an honorary Doctor of Civil Law degree from Oxford University. Across Britain, he was hailed. London's Daily Telegraph characterized Truman as the living and kicking symbol of everything that everybody likes best about the United States. Quote, in 1975, the Truman Scholarship was created as a federal program to honor U.S. college students who exemplified dedication to public service and leadership in public policy. Despite Truman's attempt to curtail the naval carrier arm, which led to the 1949 Revolt of the Admirals. Harry S. Truman National Historic Site includes the Wallace House at 219 N. Delaware in Independence and the Family Farmhouse at Grandview, Missouri. Truman sold most of the farm for Kansas City suburban development including the Truman Corners Shopping Center. Harry S. Truman Birthplace State Historic Site is the house where Truman was born and spent 11 months in Lamar, Missouri. Books Binning, William C. Esterly, Larry E. Trasic, Paul A. Encyclopedia of American Parties, Campaigns, and Elections, Westport, C.T. Greenwood, ISBN 978-0-8131-17553. Burns, Brian, Harry S. Truman, His Life and Times, Kansas City, M.S., Kansas City Starbucks, ISBN 978-0-97-400-09-3-0. Chambers 2, John W., The Oxford Companion to American Military History. Oxford, Oxford University Press, ISBN 0-19-507198-0. Cohen, Elliot A., Gooch, John, Military Misfortunes, The Anatomy of Failure in War, New York, Free Press, ISBN 978-0-7432-8082-2. Current, Richard Nelson, Friedel, Frank Burt, Williams, Thomas Harry, American History, A Survey, 2, New York, Knopf, Egan, Joanne C., Hale, Donald R., E.D.S., Branded as Rebels, Madison, Y., University of Wisconsin Press, ASIN B003GWL8J6, Eisler, Kim Isaac, A Justice for All, William J., Brennan, Jr., and the decisions that transformed America. New York, Simon and Schuster. ISBN 9780671767877. Farrell, Robert Hugh, Harry S. Truman, A Life, Columbia, Missouri, University of Missouri Press. ISBN 9780826210500. Freeland, Richard M. The Truman Doctrine and the Origins of McCarthyism. New York, Alfred A. Knopf. ISBN 978-0-8147-2576-4. Giglio, James N. Truman in Cartoon and Caricature. Kirksville, Me. Truman State University Press. ISBN 978-0-8138-1806-1. Goodwin, Doris Kearns. No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, The Home Front in World War II, New York, Simon & Schuster, ISBN 978-0-671-64240-2. Hamby, Alonzo L., Ed., Harry S., Truman and the Fair Deal, Lexington, M.A., B., C., Heath & Co., ISBN 978-0-669-87080-0. Hamby, Alonzo L., Man of the People, A Life of Harry S. Truman, Oxford, Oxford University Press, ISBN 978-0-19-504-5468. Hamilton, Lee H., Relations Between the President and Congress in Wartime, in James A. Thurber. Rivals for Power, Presidential, Congressional Relations, Roman and Littlefield, ISBN 0-7425-6142-9.
Holstein, Ole, Public Opinion and American Foreign Policy, Ann Arbor, Me, The University of Michigan Press, ISBN 978-0-472-06619-3, Judas, John B., Genesis, Truman, American Jews, and the Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, New York, Farrar, Strauss and Giroux, ISBN 978-0-374-16109-5. Kirkendall, Richard S., Harry S., Truman Encyclopedia, Boston, G. K., Hull Publishing, ISBN 978-0-8161-8915-1. Kletzel, James E., Charles, Steve, E.D.S., Scott Standard Postage Stamp Catalog, 1. Sydney, O. Scott Publishing Co., ISBN 978-0-89487-460-4. Lenzowski, George, American Presidents in the Middle East, Durham, N.C., Duke University Press, ISBN 978-0-8223-0972-7. McCoy, Donald R., the Presidency of Harry S. Truman, Lawrence, Kays, University Press of Kansas, ISBN 978-0-7006-0252-0. McGregor, Morris J. Jr., Integration of the Armed Services 1940-1965, Washington, D. C. Center of Military History, ISBN 978-0-16-001925-8. Margolies, Daniel S., ed. A Companion to Harry S. Truman, 614 pp. Emphasis on Historiography, C. Sean J. Savage, Truman in Historical, Popular, and Political Memory, pp. 9, 25, excerpt. Martin. Joseph William, My First Fifty Years in Politics as Told to Robert J. Donovan, New York, McGraw-Hill, Miller, Merle, Plain Speaking, An Oral Biography of Harry S. Truman, New York, Putnam Publishing, ISBN 978-0-399-11261-4. Mitchell, Franklin D., Harry S., Truman and the News Media. Contentious Relations, Bladed Respect, Columbia, Mo, University of Missouri Press, ISBN 0-8262-1180-1. Oshinsky, David M., Harry Truman, In Brinkley, Allen, Dyer, Davis, The American Presidency, Boston, Houghton Mifflin, ISBN 978-0-618-382736. Patricia, David, 1948, Harry Truman's Improbable Victory in the Year That Transformed America, New York, Union Square Press, ISBN 978-1-402-767-487, Savage, Sean J., Roosevelt, The Party Leader, 1932-1945, Lexington, KY, The University Press of Kentucky, ISBN 978-0-8131-17553. Skidmore, Max J., After the White House, Former Presidents as Private Citizens. Rev. Ed., New York, Macmillan, ISBN 978-0-312-29559-2. Stoll, Michael, National Interest in State Terrorism. The Politics of Terrorism, New York. CRC Press. Stokesbury, James L., A Short History of the Korean War. New York, Harper Perennial, ISBN 978-0-688-09513-0. Troy, Gill, Leading from the Center, Why Moderates Make the Best Presidents. New York, Basic Books, ISBN 978-0465-00293-1. Truman, Harry S., Farrell, Robert H., ed., The Autobiography of Harry S., Truman, Columbia, Missouri, University of Missouri Press, 
ISBN 0-8262-14452. Weinstein, Allen. Perjury. The His Chambers Case. Revised Ed. New York. Random House. ISBN 0-679-77338-X. Journals. Griffith. Robert. Ed. Autumn 1975. Truman and the Historians. The Reconstruction of Postwar American History. The Wisconsin Magazine of History. 59. Heckler. Ken. L.C. George M. The Greatest Upset in American Political History. Harry Truman and the 1948 Election. White House Studies. Winter. Mitray. James I. Truman's Plan for Victory. National Self-Determination and the 38th Parallel Decision in Korea. Journal of American History. 66. 314. doi. 10.2307 1,900,879. ISSN 0021-8723. JSTOR 1,900,879. May. Ernest R. 1947. 48. When Marshall kept the U.S. out of war in China. The Journal of Military History. JSTOR 3,093,261. Neustadt. Richard E. Congress and the Fair Deal. A Legislative Balance Sheet. Public Policy. Boston. 5. Reprinted in Hamby 1974. pp. 15. 42. Strout. Lawrence N. Covering McCarthyism. How the Christian Science Monitor Handled Joseph R. McCarthy. 1950-1954. Journal of Political and Military Sociology. 2001. Summer. Wells. Jr. Samuel F. Autumn 1979. Sounding the Toxin. NSC 68 and the Soviet Threat. International Security. 4. 116. Doi. 10. 2307. 2626746. JSTOR 2626746 Time Gibbs Nancy When new president meets old It's not always pretty Time Retrieved September 4, 2012 Armed Forces Ravolt of the Admirals Time October 17, 1949 Retrieved July 25, 2012 Subscription required. Help. The Art of the Possible. Time. June 6, 1949. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. Historical Notes. Giving them more hell. Time. December 3, 1973. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. The Man of Spirit. Time. August 13, 1956. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. National Affairs. Taft. Hartley. How it works and how it has worked. Time. October 19, 1959. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. The Presidency. The World of Harry Truman. Time. January 8, 1973. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. The Wonderful Waste Basket. Time. 3. March 24, 1952. Retrieved July 25, 2012. Subscription required. Help. The Washington Post. Barnes. Bart. Margaret Truman Daniel dies at age 83. The Washington Post. Retrieved April 2nd. 2010. Bar. Cameron W. Listing Madonna Rescued in Bethesda. The Washington Post. Retrieved April 4, 2010. Smith. J. Y. Paul Hume. Music critic who panned Truman Daughter Singing and Drew Presidential Rap. Pittsburgh Post Gazette via The Washington Post. Retrieved July 22, 2012. New York Times. 
Weintraub, Stanley, MacArthur's War Korea and the Undoing of an American Hero. The New York Times. Retrieved September 3, 2012. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. John Greco. D. M. Griffin. Robert E. The Airlift Begins. Airbridge to Berlin. Question mark. The Berlin Crisis of 1948. Its Origins and Aftermath. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 28, 2012. Marks. Ted. Oral History Interview with Ted Marks. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 27, 2012. Southern. Mrs. William. Wedding of Bess Wallace and Capt. Harry S. Truman. The Examiner. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 29, 2012. Strout. Richard L. Oral History Interview with Richard L. Strout. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 27, 2012. Truman. Harry. Memo Recognizing the State of Israel. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 28, 2012. Truman. Harry. World War I Letter from Harry to Bess. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 24, 2012. Best. Kathleen. Truman's First Democratic Convention. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved November 18, 2012. Background Information. The Truman Balcony. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved October 16, 2012. Background Information. Continued. Quote. The Truman Balcony. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved October 16, 2012. Biographical Sketch of Mrs. Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 29, 2012. Chronological Record of the 129th Field Artillery 1917. 1919. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 27, 2012. Eleanor and Harry. The Correspondence of Eleanor Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 28, 2012. Fact. Is the letter on display that Truman wrote in defense of his daughter's singing. Quote. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. December 6, 1950. Retrieved July 29, 2012. Harry S. Truman Post Presidential Papers. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 28, 2012. Harry Truman joins Battery B of the Missouri National Guard. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 27, 2012. Memorandum of Information for the Secretary. Question mark. Blockade of Korea. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. July 6, 1950. Retrieved July 28, 2012. Military Personnel File of Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 27, 2012. President Lyndon B. Johnson signs Medicare Bill. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. July 30, 1965. Retrieved July 29, 2012. President Truman addresses Congress on proposed health program. Washington, D. C. This day in Truman history. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. November 19, 1945. Retrieved July 27, 2012. McDonald, John W. Ten of Truman's happiest years spent in Senate. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved May 10. 2014. Originally published in the Independence Examiner. Truman Centennial Edition. Special Message to the Congress on Civil Rights. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved December 2, 2012. Use of the period after the S in Harry S. Truman's name. Harry S. Truman Library and Museum. Retrieved July 24, 2012.